All right, let's go to another one that I've mentioned a couple times. This is TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. It is one of the most famous cytokines. You've probably heard of C-reactive protein or CRP. That's probably a little more famous, but TNF alpha is a close second, particularly in the research realm. It's not commonly measured in clinical settings, but we rely on it a lot as a signal of inflammation. TNF-alpha directly causes insulin resistance. In fact, this is why in the past you've heard me talk about inflammation as a primary cause of insulin resistance. It's because things like TNF-alpha can just come to a cell and cause that cell to become insulin resistant. Now, beyond the insulin resistance is just the effects of chronic inflammation, like promoting atherosclerosis and heart disease. So there are more consequences with this. Now, think for a moment. Given everything I've just described, how do you think TN-alpha levels are affected by adipocyte hypertrophy? Does the swelling adipocyte create more TNF-alpha or less? Yes, it creates more. I'm sure that's what you were thinking and full marks for you. Um, so as the adipocyte swells, so too does TNF-alpha production. It goes up accordingly, promoting more insulin resistance and promoting more inflammation. So this next one that I'll be brief with is also a cytokine, but it's also a hormone because it flows from one cell type and impacts another through the blood, but it's also a clotting factor. And that by, by clotting, I mean C-L-O-T-T-I-N-G, a blood clot. And this um, molecule, this hormone is called plasminogen activator inhibitor one. Isn't that a mouthful? It's such a mouthful that we will just say PAI1. And if you want to look it up, you can just type in PAI1 and you'll get all the hits you want. So PAI1 will directly promote the formation of clots. Well, it actually prevents the breakdown of clots because it's, it's one thing to form a clot, but we have in place mechanisms to get rid of the clot. Um, through, through a normal process, because sometimes we want a clot. Sometimes we want to stop blood from leaking out of a blood vessel if it's a bruise or a cut or whatever. But we need to be able to break those clots down. PAI1 stops the breakdown of the clot. And thus, someone with more PAI1 will have a greater tendency to form clots. And this could very much be at the heart of why people who are overweight or obese have a much higher risk of heart disease, mortality, or complications. Because if you're just forming more clots, you're going to have a much easier time developing a stroke or an infarction or heart attack. Now, I'm sure you've already come to this conclusion, but just to confirm it and put a fine point on it, the larger the fat cell gets, the more PAI1 levels go up. Okay, the last one. Some of you more astute students in the metabolic classroom have been wondering about the other fat depot that I've not mentioned yet today. We've talked about subcutaneous fat. We've talked about visceral fat. Can you remember the other one? Brown fat. So brown adipose tissue is a unique fat type. And yes, even it is involved in the endocrinology of adipose tissue, producing several hormones. I only want to mention one, and that is triiodothyronine. Now, do you hear something familiar? It is a long, multi-syllabic hormone, triiodothyronine. This is the active form of thyroid hormone, also called T3. T3 is heavily produced from brown adipose tissue, but not all the time. Now, let me just explain this in a little bit of detail. You're, of course, very familiar with the thyroid gland. Thyroid hormone is one of the most important signals in the body for setting metabolic rate and overall metabolic health. Higher thyroid hormone, within reason, generally is going to be a metabolically favorable scenario. Now, please, emphasis italicized within reason. If it goes too high, it just becomes purely harmful, purely pathogenic. But on average, people who have slightly higher levels within a physiological range um, with T3 will be a little leaner and less resi uh, more, more resistant to things like weight gain and diabetes and insulin resistance. Now, th the thyroid gland produces a relatively modest amount of T3. It produces relatively more amounts of the inactive form called thyroxine, which is T4. 
And then T4 will have one of the iodine molecules stripped off of it as it moves into various tissues throughout the body. So the thyroid gland releases T4. Tissues throughout the body will pull in the T4 and release it as T3. And so the, the whole body is sort of helping in this process of actually creating T3. And when brown adipose tissue is turned on, like through cold therapy or through a little bit of caffeine or through exercise, when brown adipose tissue is turned on, it becomes the highest producer of T3. It begins pulling in more T4 than any tissue and releasing more T3 than any tissue. And this, of course, this is a potent activator of metabolic rates. So therefore, cold exposure is not only stimulating brown adipose tissue to burn more calories and produce heat, but it also enhances the local production of T3 or the conversion of T4 into T3, making something like cold immersion um, one of the most potent stimuli for increasing thyroid hormone, active thyroid hormone production. And then that T3 not only further stimulates the brown adipose tissue itself through a process that we commonly refer to as an autocrine effect. So autocrine is when a cell produces a hormone that stimulates itself. But then there is, of course, the endocrine effect, which is when the brown adipose is just releasing the thyroid hormone into general circulation. I know cold therapy is uncomfortable, believe me. I know as much as I've done it in the past, I still just shudder to actually get in that bath and shiver. 